Last week we covered the fifth trumpet judgment. Now we'll move on to the sixth. Revelation chapter 9, beginning with verse 13. Then the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. One saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. And the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and day and month and year were released so that they would kill a third of mankind. The number of the armies of the horsemen was 200 million. I heard the number of them. And this is how I saw the vision of the horses and those who sat on them. The riders had breastplates the color of fire and hyacinth and of brimstone, and the heads of the horses were like the heads of lions. And out of their mouths proceed fire and smoke and brimstone. A third of mankind was killed by these three plagues, by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone which proceeded out of their mouths. For the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails. For their tails are like serpents and have heads, and with them they do harm. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands so as not to worship demons and the idols of gold and of silver and of brass and of stone and of wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their immorality, nor of their thefts. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. And Lord, we are eternally grateful that we are not going to endure what we're reading about today. But please minister to us, Lord, with your word, with what you have for us today. However you want to minister to our hearts, we want to be subject. We want to be open to your word and let your word have authority over our lives, Lord, that we be further conformed to the image of Christ. That's what we ask now, Lord, is lead us by your Spirit. Have your way with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Verse 13. Then the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. Horns in the Bible represent power, authority, strength to rescue, means of refuge. Luke 169 refers to Jesus as the horns of salvation, using the horn of salvation. The horns of the altar in the Old Testament is seen as a place where mercy is found. Exodus 21 verses 12 through 14 says, "He who strikes a man so that he dies shall surely be put to death. But if he did not lie in wait for him, but God let him fall into his hand, then I will appoint you a place to which he may flee. If, however, a man acts presumptuously toward his neighbor, so as to kill him craftily, you are to take him even from my altar, that he may die. So if someone were to, in the heat of a moment, get in a tussle and, and self-defense, kill another man. If he were to acknowledge his wrongdoing, he could flee to the altar and, and take hold of the horns of the altar, and that man could find refuge there. However, if a man committed premeditated murder, who wasn't just overcome by passion, but he reasons within himself to plot and to murder, even if that man were to go to the altar and grab hold of the horns, he was to be killed. And we see this took place with Solomon when he was king, with his older brother Adonijah, and also Joab. Upon King David's death, Joab, he was the king's captain, he made a plan to take Solomon's older brother Adonijah and make a march for the throne and to place him before the people as king and to usurp the throne from Solomon. And this attempt was unsuccessful. So Solomon's brother Adonijah 
He fled to the temple and he laid hold of the horns of the altar. And Solomon forgave him. And then he gave him sanctuary and a second chance. After Adonijah had done this, the king's captain, Joab, who planned the coup, he thought, well, I'll do the same thing. I'm going to do it as well. So he went and laid hold of the horns of the altar. And the king's guard arrived and, and they said, let go. And Joab said, no, you can strike me where I stand. So they reported to King Solomon and Solomon said, strike him where he stands. Joab was a murderer. He, he murdered a premeditated murder. He was a bit of a scoundrel and he did this multiple times. He committed premeditated murder. He wasn't remorseful. Uh, he reasoned within himself to do it. It was one of those situations, he's not really sorry, he's just sorry he got caught. But he was going through the motions of religion, thinking that it would save him. He saw Adonijah do it, oh, I'll do it too. Spurgeon had this to say, quote, Joab found no benefit of sanctuary, even though he laid hold of the horns of the altar of God's house. From which I gather this lesson, that outward ordinances will avail nothing. Before the living God, who is greater and wiser than Solomon, it will be of no avail to any man to lay hold upon the horns of the altar. But secondly, there is an altar, a spiritual altar, whereof if a man do lay hold upon the horns and say, Nay, but I will die here, he shall never die. But he shall be safe against the sword of justice forever. For the Lord has appointed an altar in the person of his own dear son, Jesus Christ. Where there shall be shelter for the very vilest of sinner, if they do but come and lay hold thereon. End quote. Amen. 2 Samuel 22.3, Psalm 18.2, and Luke 1.69 all speak of the horn of salvation. That's Jesus. And these horns on this altar represent Christ as the governing sovereign authority of which if you lay hold of, you can be saved. And from the altar that John sees, from the horns of that altar, where mercy and refuge is found, he doesn't hear Hosanna to save us, Lord, save us in the highest. No one is laying hold of the horns of the altar for salvation. Instead, he hears verses 14 and 15. Read with me. One saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. And the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and day and month and year were released so that they would not, so, excuse me, so that they would kill a third of mankind. So these four angels, they're different from the four angels previously mentioned in Revelation chapter 7. The angels that were holding back the four winds of judgment. Those were good angels. These angels here in verse 14 are fallen angels because they're bound. Demons are always spoken of as being bound. Good angels would never need to be bound. They exist in perfect obedience to God. Hebrews 1.14 speaks of angels are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? They want to help mankind. God would never hinder them from assisting his children. These four are bound and bound at the great river Euphrates. Now the tribulation is a global scale judgment. Why is the focal point always the Middle East? Why not the, the Ohio River, the, the Loire River, why the Euphrates? Jeremiah 30, verse 7, uh, the tribulation is referred to as Jacob's trouble. So although the proportions are global, it's centered around Israel. The Euphrates River is mentioned all the way back in Genesis chapter 2. The river that flowed out of the Garden of Eden and then split into four, one of those four was the Euphrates. It's 1,780 miles long, and it's by far the most important, greatest river in Western Asia. But what's most significant about the Euphrates is it's used as demarcation for God's land covenant with Israel. 
And you could pull up a map today and say, wait, wait a second, there's the Euphrates, and then th there's Iraq, and there's Syria that it's running through, not running through Israel. And that's true by today's mapping. But Genesis 15 verse 18 says, The Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, To your descendants I have given this land from the river of Egypt as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. So as far as God's concerned, Israel doesn't stop at the Jordan River. It stops at the Euphrates River. And in the future, God will restore Israel to its sovereignly ordained proper borders. When God made his covenant with Abraham, he established the Euphrates River as the place where God's people wouldn't dwell past. That was the border. And it's interesting that this is where these four bad fallen angels were bound. At the place just outside the promised land borders. These four angels who had been prepared for the hour and day and month and year. John Wolverd said, Just as the great fish was prepared to swallow Jonah to effect divine discipline on the prophet, so these angels were released so that they would kill a third of mankind. Previously, one-fourth of the earth's population was killed in the breaking of the fourth seal. Combined with this third of the population being killed, that means over half the earth's population is gone by these two judgments alone. For reference, that's roughly every continent in the world except for Asia. Gone. And bear in mind, the worst that the earth has experienced, black plague, wars, world wars, all the wars combined, doesn't come close to this. The closest world event would be when God flooded the earth. And how the world is prepared for this coming event is similar to the days before the flood as well. Jesus compared the two events. In Matthew 24, 37 through 39, he says, For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. The world's not preparing and anticipating the tribulation. Right? Right now they're eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, just like in the days of Noah. Just like in the days of Noah, when God shuts the ark, or in our, our case, when God raptures the church, that's it. You're in the tribulation, and you'll probably die. For those who repent and believe in Christ, they'll most likely be martyred. For those who won't repent, God's going to remove them from the land of the living to make the world ready for His millennial kingdom. And after what we just studied last week, though those five months of no one dying, being stung by scorpion-tailed locusts, the tempo of death really picks up. The good guys are dying. The bad guys are dying. The, the only ones that aren't dying are the 144,000 that were sealed. And death totals don't just rival when God flooded the earth. Because the amount of people that will die by the woes will actually be more than the amount of people who died during the earth's flood. Uh, the population is... Today, so much greater than the antediluvian period, the time before the flood happened. There weren't billions of people that died in the flood. Billions of people are going to die in the woes of the tribulation. Verse 16 tells us how a third of the population is killed. The number of the armies of the horsemen was 200 million. I heard the number of them. Some take this number as to be non-literal, like Myriads and myriads, ten thousands and ten thousands, or others take it literal. I'm inclined to take it as a literal 200 million, simply for the reason that John makes it a point to tell his readers, I heard the number. He didn't just look around and say, oh, myriads, ten thousands. He heard the number. And now as we previously read the description of the, the demon locusts, that's how we're going to read the description of the 200 million. We're just going to read it. Picture it in your mind's eye. Verses 17 through 19. And this is how I saw in the vision the horses and those who sat on them. 
The riders had breastplates the color of fire and of hyacinth. That's a, a, a dark blue or purple. And of brimstone and the heads of the horses are like the heads of lions. And out of their mouths proceed fire and smoke and brimstone. A third of mankind was killed by these three plagues, by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone, which proceed out of their mouths. For the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails. For their tails are like the tails of serpents and have heads, and with them they do harm. Stop there. So there's two possible views for this passage in the 200 million. And that's that it's comprised of demons. Horses with heads like lions and they're breathing fire and have vicious tails. 200 million of these powerful killer demons could certainly wipe out a third of the earth's population. No problem. Starting with roughly 8 billion. A quarter of the population gone with the fourth seal. And that would bring us to 6 billion. A third of the 6 billion is 2 billion. So 2 billion divided by 200 million is 10. Okay? Each of these killer demons have to take out 10 people. Easy peasy. They can do it no problem. The other view that's held is the 200 million are actually men. And it's 200 million man army that's influenced by the four angels. And as John is witnessing these millions... The description he gives is that of modern warfare. And he, he would have no clue what it is that he's witnessing. The riders with breastplates, armor perhaps, a tank's armor. You see a main gun. It looks like a tail shooting, you know, 20 millimeter rounds. Looks like fire breathing, like a roaring lion. Black powder, gunpowder, explosives weren't created for hundreds more years. So it could be that John's describing as best as he can with reference points that he has from his time. Horses, brimstone, sounds of chariots. Whether it's modern weaponry mowing people down or horse lions breathing fire, I want no part of it. It's going to be a mass violent execution. I really don't want any part of it if it's literal fire breathing lion horses. Uh, yeah, I blow me away with the tank, whatever. I have no desire to be burned. I hate getting burned. I have no desire to help the firefighters in our congregation. Thank you so much for the work that you do. I burnt my tongue on Hannah's taco soup last week, and it just, I was ready to go be with the Lord. <laughs> when she gets burned in the kitchen cooking, my soul aches. I hate it so much. There is no pain like being burned. And millions, possibly billions of people are going to be burned alive by the fire and brimstone that comes from these mouths. And verse 20 tells us of those who remain alive. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the work of their hands so as not to worship demons and the idols of gold and of silver and of brass and of stone and of wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. So by this time, you would suspect anyone who is still breathing that they would exhibit deep, deep contrition. That the entire world would harmoniously cry out in the key of agony Save us, Jesus, mercy. And they're not ready to give up their idolatry. Not one of these suffering souls on the face of the earth is ready to turn from their sin, from the very things that's killing them. We see this all around us in the world today. Everyone knows methamphetamines and heroin is bad. That's common knowledge around the world, but people will shoot it and shoot it until they die. People will be hacking up a lung with an oxygen tank while they spark up another cigarette. And the world calls it addiction. It says it's an illness. The Bible doesn't call it that. You know what the Bible calls it? Worship. It's what it is. Anything that man puts in front of God or worships in place of God or obeys instead of God. 
Anything man can't stop thinking about, stop obsessing over, stop worrying about, stop pursuing, stop desiring, anything he worships that's not God is an idol. In the Old Testament, you make an idol out of anything, out of a tree. Today, an idol can easily be a phone, TV, a spouse, children, a job, a money. For an unsaved man, anything can be an idol. For the born-again Christian, nothing can be an idol. Luke 14, 26, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brother and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. I love my wife. She is a terrible God. Philippians 3, 7 through 8, But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as lost for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ. I'm not going to settle for gold or silver, brass or stone, which neither see nor hear nor walk. I'm not even going to settle for a person to be my God. As great as Hannah is, look, she was gone. She's not always there. My children, if I need someone at 3 a.m., you got to wake them up, not God. He's always there. He's always around, awake, ready, thinking of me. Hey, so good to see you. I've been waiting for you this whole time. You can't compete with that, a God who doesn't sleep. The Apostle Paul tells us, 1 Corinthians 10, 20, that if a person worships anything other than God, an idol, he worships demons. Because if you choose an idol to put anything before God, it's rebellion, and it's to follow in the footsteps of demons. To follow in the footsteps of Adam and Eve, they followed in the footsteps of Satan. They worshipped Satan in the garden instead of God. And you can say, wait, I didn't see Adam or Eve or read about them bowing down before Satan. Okay? We can't physically right now bow down before Jesus in person. But we can witness someone worship him. How? How did Jesus say that you will recognize the Christian? By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. How do you spot a disciple of Satan? Have love for yourself. Be selfish. Worship yourself by doing whatever you want. Satan doesn't care if you worship him, if you worship anything. Let it be gold, silver, brass, stone, wood, whatever you want. As long as it's not God. That's why idol worship is the worship of demons. It's self-willed living just like Satan. Living out Satan's creed of Isaiah 14, I will, I will, I will. Now the result of this living is verse 21. And they did not repent of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their immorality, nor of their thefts. So this is the conduct that follows choosing idolatry, idols, other gods, instead of the true and living God. It's selfism, where the ends always justify the means, even murder. James 4.2 says, you lust and do not have, so you commit murder. The world is going to have fewer resources than ever before in the history of the planet. The murder rate is going to take off like a rocket. And to think of how little of a thing, something so small, a person will murder another person for in the tribulation. Think of how little of a thing that someone will murder a baby for. Abortion happens for convenience. Murder shouldn't be normal to society. 1 Timothy 1.9 says, God gave man his law to prevent immorality and murder. And as man sets aside God's law and immerses himself in immorality and murder, bloodshed, demon worship and murder and thieving and murder, his mind starts to unravel. 
So he turns to sorcery. Uh, this is my step on toes. I'll preface this. It's my job to tell you all what the passage says, just to tell you the truth. And what you do with that truth, between you and God, that's between you and God. So, amen? Okay. The Greek word for sorcery is pharmakia. It's where we get pharmaceutical, pharmacy. This word doesn't speak of Tylenol or, or insulin. Uh, this is specifically mind-altering drugs, or what's called psychotropic drugs. A drug that interacts with the neurotransmitters in the brain, affecting how the brain works, affecting mood, awareness, thoughts, feelings, or behavior. Examples of psychotropic substances include marijuana, LSD, certain pain medicines, antidepressants, anxiety medications, antipsychotics, stimulants such as amphetamines found in ADD and ADHD medications, and selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, otherwise called SSRIs. When someone chooses to engage in sorcery and to alter their mind with pharmakia, even if it's legally prescribed, it's sin. God says, be anxious for nothing. If anxiety is a problem, anxiety medication is not the solution God would have you turn to. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. If you've prayed and you're still anxious, God might want you to pray some more. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds. God will take care of your mind. God says, rejoice in the Lord always. If it's depression, antidepressants aren't the solution God would have you turn to. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, there is any excellence and anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. Ephesians 4 says, that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. That happens through the exposure of God's Word. What's taking place right now, if we let it, if we say, God, change me, change my mind by your Spirit and by your Word. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. If I try to live contrary to Scripture, by God's Spirit, God will cause me to feel shame. And I'm not going to be happy to live in sin. That's a good thing. That's God's Spirit. Ephesians 5.18 Do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. I don't want anything else in this world telling me how to feel. Not culture, not my friends, not medication, not family. I don't want to feel shame over things I shouldn't feel shame for. And I don't want to not feel shame when I should. If someone's born again and they feel shame over something or anxiety or depression or whatever, you don't want to numb that feeling. It's an indicator that something's wrong and God's trying to get your attention. And He'll prescribe the solution through Scripture. Amen? Amen. If you can't say amen, you got to say ouch. Amen? Amen. All right, Jason, if you want to come up and men get ready for... Passing out communion. At this point, the world is going to be so desensitized. Their hearts will be so hardened against God. Their minds polluted. All behavior will be acceptable. Murder, immorality, that's porneia. Pornography will be rampant. It'll be everywhere. Theft, everyone will be on drugs robbing each other, killing each other. Their hands will be bloody, and whatever they're holding by the time the screaming stops will be worth it, it'll be okay, it'll be all right, because they're going to be doped up and deluded, and that their thieving, murderous, pornographic reality is okay. All the while, they're watching people be burned alive by fire-breathing horses. God is smiting them, 
They know it's the creator of heaven and earth, God smashing them with his rod, trying to steer them away from the gates of hell, brutally, at all costs, guiding them to repentance, saying, grab hold of my altar, claim mercy and Jesus Christ, and they won't do it. They reject him. Give us our silver, gold, brass, and wood. They choose their idols still. Psalm 115 says, Their idols are silver and gold, the work of man's hands. They have mouths, but they cannot speak. They have eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, but they cannot hear. They have noses, but they cannot smell. They have hands, but they cannot feel. And they have feet, but they cannot walk. They cannot make a sound with their throat. Those who make them will become like them, everyone who trusts in them. They'll become senseless. They won't be able to feel. They won't be able to see truth. Look how dull and senseless the world is going to be at this point. Even without being inoculated by pharmakia, just the sheer hardness of heart that man will have. That men have today, some of our loved ones that refuse to repent. They have hardened hearts. You're in good company with God. He wishes he could force their repentance too. We all used to have hard hearts before we repented and turned to Christ. I love my new soft heart. Some of you probably think it could be softer, but I man, I'm a sissy now. I am. Hannah loves it. She used to just bully me around the house all day. (laughs) Even after we lay, lay hold of the altar of Christ, and are saved, we always have to be on the lookout for idols because they change us. They will conform us to their image instead of the image of Christ. And no matter how small of a thing we think something is in our life and in our heart, if God puts his finger on it and he says this right here, I want you to get rid of it. That's it. That's all there is. We either have to obey Or commit idolatry. And if an an idol gets identified in our life, that's a good thing. Praise God. We want to get rid of it. We don't want to keep idols. Hallelujah. So the thing can be gone, right? All right, as the song is played, going into communion, remember our Lord's sacrifice. Remember why he died. It wasn't so we could keep idols. So let's examine ourselves rightly. If there's anything we need to repent of, take care of it so we can commune rightly. Amen? Go ahead, man. Lamb of God from heaven's throne Sent down to call the broken home Yet as he loved they laughed and mocked He led their Savior to the cross His body hung between two thieves Nails piercing through his hands and feet The veil was torn with one last cry Our sins against the darkened sky You bore my burdens My guilt and my shame my sins forgotten, but your love, it remains. The cross at Calvary led to the empty grave. Risen and exalted, Lord Jesus, you reign. The 
Father's love for all to see. Define the course of all humanity. A vacant tomb found on day three. The grave claimed nothing but our victory. You bore my burdens, my guilt and my shame, my sins forgotten, but your love, it remains. The cross of Calvary led to the empty grave, risen and exalted, Lord Jesus, you reign. See the Father's crown upon your thorn-pierced brow. I see your blood poured out over me. You broke the power of hell the day that Satan fell. You have won the victory. Father's crown upon your thorn pierced brow. I see your blood poured out over me. You broke the power of hell the day that Satan fell. You have won the victory. my burden, my guilt and my shame, my sins forgotten, and your love, it remains. The cross at Calvary led to the empty grave, risen and exalted, Lord Jesus, you reign. For my burdens, my guilt and my shame, my sins forgotten, but your love, it remains. The cross at Calvary led to the empty grave, risen and exalted, Lord Jesus, you reign. Jesus left us with two ordinances, baptism and communion, uh, bapti or communion and remembrance of his sacrifice, the bread representing his body broken, the cup, his blood poured out in the new covenant. To remember and be thankful for that sacrifice, that we can just come to him, however we are, dirty, unclean and we can just come to him we can just pop in whenever we want what a privilege when you read about all it took to go before him in the old covenant what the priests had to wear all the garments all the ordinances everything they had to do not us just in our regular old clothes wherever we're at praise God because of the sacrifice that he made for us that we can commune with him all the time amen Will you eat and drink with me? We stand. Let's pray. Father, thank you for sending your son, the sacrifice of your only begotten, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for your spirit, Lord. 
in the work of sanctification that you do in our lives. Please keep that work going, Lord. Help us to adhere to that work, Lord, the work of holiness and godliness. Please bless everyone who came today, Lord. Equip us further for better ministry, Lord, better service to bring you more glory. We love you. We praise you. Help us to live for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.